So this video is a bit of a mixed bag about EVs. I'm going to talk about three types of EV, which is relevant to all EV buyers, some EV powertrains, a subject I've covered before, but this time in a different context, and really what started the idea for this video, which is talking about Jaunt's Land Rover electric powertrain. So let's start with the three types of EVs. You've got your ground up, and these are vehicles which are designed right from the start to be electric, and they make the best type of electric vehicles. You only find them from original equipment manufacturers like Porsche, Tesla, etc., and the like. Then we've got what I term ICE OEM, and these are vehicles which are originally designed for petrol or diesel engines, but now have an electric engine in them. Here's an example of a Hyundai Kona. Now, an example of where that's compromised would be that typically these vehicles don't have a front or front trunk because they used to have um, a ice engine in there now it's got an electric motor takes up less space but they haven't really designed a car from the ground up for electric so it is a bit compromised and then finally we've got the EV Resto Mod. Resto Mod is a restoration modification where you take an old vehicle and electrify it. So what makes a good EV kit Resto Mod? Well I think there's three criteria each of which these vehicles fulfill. The first one is that it has to be relatively old and the reason for that is it makes for a simpler conversion. With old vehicles you probably don't even have ABS, certainly not stability control, you don't have lots of airbags and safety systems, systems and there's just less complexity. You've pretty much just got a chassis with a drivetrain and that's it and that's what these three vehicles are. The second criteria is they've got to be fairly common. If you're going to go and design a drop-in kit for it, well then you need to have enough of a market for to make the tooling and the sales and everything worthwhile. And these three vehicles are not only old but they're certainly common as well. And the third criteria is they have to be cool and desirable and want to and I would definitely say the Mini, the 911 and the Defender um, and the 110, 90 are absolutely cool and desirable vehicles, hence there are drop-in kits for all three. Now let's talk about powertrains and that starts um, with the ground up powertrain which is actually really simple. It's called a skateboard architecture and the reason is well it looks like a skateboard. There's really just two parts that there's the battery and in ground up ve um, battery vehicles the, you typically find that the battery is between the front and the rear wheels and it's down low and it's shaped pretty much flat rectangular like this one. So you've got that weight down low and central which gives the EV relatively good hand hand despite the fact it's often quite heavy. Then you've got a motor at the back and, and that's pretty much it, just battery and motor. Um, th that, that is your basic skateboard. Now if we switch over to a all-wheel drive, so we're driving all four wheels here as opposed to just the rear wheels here, the front wheels aren't driven there, then it is pretty similar. Again we've got the battery over here, we've got a motor at the back but now we've got one at the front and this is where something I call a software powertrain comes in because we need to regulate the amount of torque or turning force or power drive to the front wheels relative to the rear wheels and we do that by software. In the old days we'd have a drive shaft with mechanical linkages and we wouldn't need to worry about it, now this is all software controlled and this is a really interesting and also potentially risky concept in new car engineering. Here's a tri-motor example, this is actually a representation of the Cybertruck. We've got two motors at the back, that's individual wheel drive, I'll explain that in a moment, and one at the front and there's the battery again. All right, so let's talk about EV four-wheel drive drivetrains now, and we'll start off with what I term CWD or combined wheel drive, and just using a petrol or diesel ICE engine, internal combustion engine, as a reference. Here we've got the engine that will drive some form of transfer case or on gearbox, and it will then have a prop shaft to the rear wheels, a differential which allows the left and the right wheels to spin at different speeds going around the corner. I've got other videos where I explain that, and at the front another prop shaft going to the front differential and then um, from there axles going to the left and right wheels. That is your conventional wheel drive vehicle. Now we can do away with a lot of that with electrics and move to something called IWD or individual wheel drive which in this case is quad motor one for each wheel. Here we've got a battery pack in the center and we've got four axles but they're short axles, they're stub axles and then the end of each axle is a motor. So we've got one, two, three, four motors hence motor, uh, quad motors there and then all of a sudden we don't need the prop shaft going backwards and forwards and we don't even need a differential. What we do need is a lot of 
of software engineering to replicate the effect, kind of a software differential between the left and right axle and front and, and um, left and right axle on the front and front and rear. Because when you go around the corner, each one of these four wheels will turn at different speeds and there's different torque requirements, and that suddenly makes the the job of software engineers very very complex and um, that can open up huge performance potentials but also huge risk. Now there's variations on that so we can have um, as we saw in the initial diagram there uh, just a electric motor driving a conventional differential and we can call that rear wheel drive we can have a dual motor again I showed that before um, software engineering between the front and the rear and we can have the tri-motor as well which is the, the Cybertruck um, one of the Cybertruck the Cyber Beast variant so individual wheel drive at the back but a conventional differential just driving one motor driving both wheels at the front wheel. Okay so let's talk about the series Land Rover and the Felton slash Jaunt um, powertrains then. So we're going to start off with a chassis and we're going to just look at it in first of all in four wheel drive mode and we'll start with a petrol engine um, and then we're going to connect that to a gearbox, we're going to connect that to a transfer case, and then we're going to run a prop shaft to the back, that's going to go to a differential, um, and that's going to go to an axle, and the differential again is to allow left and right wheels to go at different speeds around the corner. We run another shaft to the front, another differential, and then we have two wheels at the front driven. So that is your mode in off-road. in off -road. Now that doesn't work for on-road. The reason is that that arrangement forces the front axle to turn at the same speed as the rear axle. And when you try and do that on a high traction surface like bitumen, you get something called transmission wind-up. So we need to solve that problem. And the way Landover solved it in the early days was this. So it's the same thing we had before. They simply didn't drive the front wheels uh, when the vehicle was on road. So now I put this in grey because there is no longer a connection between this transfer case and these front wheels are not driven at all. Hence the front wheels can turn at a different faster speed going around the corner than the rear wheels. So that is your basic Land Rover series powertrain um, in petrol or, or diesel Land Rovers. Now let's take a look at what um, John and others have done for conversions. Well, the simplest way to convert a vehicle is simply to replace the petrol or diesel engine with an electric motor, which is what they've done here. That is it, right? Just remove the oily bits, put an electric motor in, job done. The Mark II version um, is a bit cleverer than that and there's significant advantages which we'll get to in a moment. So here we've got our rear axle, we've got a prop shaft, here we've got a front axle, we've got a prop shaft but we need to drive them. So how are we going to do that? Well we're going to put another differential in the middle there and that particular one is a limited slip differential which allows the front axle to turn at a different speed to the rear axle but not too much so you don't get a situation where the front axle is madly running out of traction and just spinning crazily and the rear axle or is not getting any drive at all. Okay, so how do we drive that? Well, really simple. You just literally connect an um, electric motor straight up to it. There's no need for the transfer case, the gearbox, or anything else like that. That's a really simple and neat way of doing it. So what are the pros and cons between what I've termed a Mark I and the Mark II here? Well, um, with the Mark I, you're going to get a lot of friction losses because you're going to have several speeds in this gearbox, probably four speeds, each cog turning against another cog will sap some power, it's some friction, you're going to lose some energy there. Then that goes through the transfer case and again that's going to be more power loss, so that's a problem. Um, it's only two wheel drive on road, which is not ideal, particularly when you've got a lot of torque straight off idle um, in an old vehicle with leaf springs etc which really wasn't the, first, the last word in dynamics so you've got that's not really an advantage. What it does have an advantage though it it forces the front axle to turn at the same speed as the rear axle and that four-wheel drive mode is exactly what you want for really tough four-wheel drive conditions so I'm going to give it a tick for that um, and then because you've still got the original gearbox and transfer case you can play around with the torque as much as you like and be very precisely made to out. Now you could say with considerable justification that electric motors develop all their torque off idle and you would be right but it's still sometimes nice to have the ability to vary torque a little bit and you do that with the gears. 
Then there's the question of manual fun. Do you find manual vehicles fun to drive? Well, if you do, well, this is going to be a bonus. This won't be because it doesn't have a gearbox. Um, and it also then you've got the same controls. You've got your red and yellow levers and they look familiar or maybe not familiar, but they look cool. It, it's, you know, it's, it's possibly in some ways truer to the original. So again, I put these as orange because they, they're, they're kind of um, objective or subjective. Now, with the single speed, what's the advantage? Well, the first one is that you get better performance and you get better range because there's no friction loss. You are just having this electric motor directly driving this differential um, and, and that's it. So it's really very efficient. And now you can also see why in the um, OEM models, you've got a motor directly driving the wheel here and here because the fewer gears and cogs you have in a drivetrain, the more efficient it is. And that's one reason why electric vehicles are very energy efficient. So that gives you better range, it gives you better performance, you're going to accelerate faster, there's all sorts of good things there. And you get all wheel drive grip. So when you put your foot to the floor and you accelerate, you've got all four tyres splitting that torque so you're less likely to wheel spin and do an inadvertent dome. Up, whereas in this model, on road anyway, you'd certainly um, have all the torque going through only the rear wheels. Now, there is a disadvantage of this because this differential is not lockable, it doesn't force at all times the front axle to turn at the same speed as the rear axle, and therefore I would say it's suitable for limited to medium off roading. But I would not take it on very steep hills for reasons I've explained in another video. But in short, you do run the risk of the front wheel getting all the torque and spinning, or put, maybe when you put the brakes on, locking the front axle um, and the rear continuing to spin, which can which can be dangerous on hills. But for a lot of four-wheel driving, I I think it would be absolutely fine and uh, it's also simpler to drive there's no gears there's no um, you know just get in and basically go uh, you don't have all of the gearboxes and the transfer cases of that model now there's another option as well and that is the Felton dual motor defender so we've got our prop shaft going to the back differential rear axle and the same for the front but they're not joined so what joins them well put one motor driving the front wheels one motor driving the rear wheels, which is exactly the same concept I showed earlier on, just slightly different because we've got longer prop shafts there due to the fact that it is converting um, an older petrol slash diesel vehicle. So that means that we've got twin motors and we've got that software center differential regulating the torque and the power of the front motor relative to the rear motor. So what are the pros and cons of that? Well, imagine it would be more expensive because you're buying two motors where conceivably you could only have one, but there's even fewer gears. We're not driving those gears in the differential, so that makes it more efficient and there can be more power so we can have two motors here and in fact they've got two 180 kilowatt engine so um, power motors imagine that over 350 kilowatts of power in a series Land Rover that would be insane fun I think um, now there is the potential for more performance economy if the software between the two is clever enough to deliver that and that's always a big if with those software powertrains and you could even make it purely front wheel drive rear wheel drive and that could be amazing off-road sometimes off-road there's occasions where you want to send a lot of torque to the front wheel not much to the back wheel some rock crawlers actually overdrive the front axle for that reason for example you could also very much argue, however, it takes away from the authentic experience because now all of a sudden you've got two electric motors, you've got a software drivetrain there, you don't have those levers. Maybe that's a positive for you, maybe it's a negative, but I think it's something to be considered in the wider scheme of things. So compared to the single speed version, well, that's just got your reliable, predictable mechanical centre differential. Um, it is just purely mechanical, there's no, no software involved in it because that motor just turns that and that's the end of it. Um, and it, it would be a bit cheaper as well. So which of the three is best? Well, the answer is there is no best. The purpose of this video is simply to give you an idea of what's what, so you can choose your best. But if I had to sort of describe them, each three of them, um, I'd say this one is the most authentic and best off-road again, because it locks that rear axle into the same speed as the front axle, give you maximum 
uh, control over the torque with the gear so I, and it's most authentic so that's the tick for this one this one gives you easy all-wheel drive grip for daily driving if you're not going to go really hard off road i'm talking really steep roads here i would definitely choose this one because it's just safer easier and I, I don't think it would take away too much from the experience i haven't driven all of these three drivetrains by the way i'm just using I do experience to, to make educated guesses. Um, and this one would definitely give you the maximum performance, absolutely, because it's got twin motors um, and it would be extra tech as well. So that in a way is very cool, but um, it wouldn't give you the advantages of those. So choose. So here's an interesting point now. You really want to preserve the fun parts of an authentic experience because if you've driven an old car, they look great and you get in, sometimes it's fun for a minute or two, you kind of want that authentic experience, but only the fun bits of it, not the non-fun bits of it. And I'm interested, tell me in the comments, which bits of an old car you consider to be the fun experience and the not so fun experience. And I kind of like what John's are doing here because they're trying to sort of, to, okay, how can we make it still an authentic fun experience, but get rid of the annoyances? So here's some of the things they've done. They've added disc brakes because the vehicle goes faster now you want to be able to stop better and i don't think drum brakes in my opinion are really a fun experience i like being able to stop nicely new suspension bouncing around a lot yes that could be part of it but i'd rather have modern suspension shocks um, leaf springs bushings the whole lot electric power steering you know in four-wheel driving you always told keep your thumbs out of the steering wheel and that is good advice the reason for that was the old Land Rovers and like, you know, if you went over a bump, it could just rip the steering wheel out and actually um, break your, your thumbs or your wrist. With electric power steering, that risk is reduced, which is good. No one really likes broken hands. Just ask Daniel Ricardo. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. It makes the vehicle easier to drive as well. Now, one point particular to the Land Rovers, for those that know had to um, joint, have started to use universal joints on the front, not, sorry, CVs on the front, not universal joints for a smoother ride. We won't go into technicalities of why that is. You get V2L vehicle to load, so you can actually use your, your restored vehicle as a portable generator um, in effect. You get an electric park brake because on Land Rovers um, that was a transfer case. If the transfer case goes away, well, you've got to do something else. Um, LED headlights because obviously Lucas prints of darkness, if not dimness, aircon um, and heating just to make the vehicle a little bit more livable. Again, um, to me, an old Land Rover on a really hot day with no aircon, yes, that's authentic. Is it fun? Arguably not. Um, and various safety updates, seat belts, etc. So I hope you found this video interesting. Um, I can do more on this subject if people would like, so do let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching and any questions, use the comments.